On the 3rd of April 1940, the first German ships of a secret invasion force set sail and head for Norway. Their plan calls for simultaneous invasions of Narvik, Trondheim, Bergen, Egersund, and Kristiansand, as well as the capital Oslo. With battleships covering them, the idea is to occupy the major population centres of Norway in the early hours of the 9th of April, coinciding with a similar surprise invasion of Denmark. However, Oslo lies deep inside the Oslo Fjord, and to reach it, the Kriegsmarine force will have to pass up the fjord and through the Drobak Narrows. Norwegian warships and four armed forts guard the approaches. A fifth, Oskarborg, guards the exit of the Narrows but is old and has been downgraded to a training facility and hence does not factor into the German plans. Loaded with troops and supplies, the Oslo invasion force is the largest and strongest Kriegsmarine formation, consisting of the brand new Admiral Hipper class heavy cruiser Blücher, the heavy cruiser Lutzau, light cruiser Emden, Type 23 torpedo boats Condor, Merve and Albatross, and eight R-type minesweepers which are catching up having sailed separately. Strengthening sea mist on the night of the 8th provides cover for the German ships along with a cloak of darkness, and although some of the ships are spotted by patrolling Norwegian ships and the searchlights of the outer forts, only a handful of warning shots are fired before the mysterious silhouettes move on and are lost in the gloom. The German ships do not return fire, and blind Norwegian patrol craft, who try to identify them using searchlights, with their own much more powerful beams. Now past the outer forts, the German formation halts, while six minesweepers take troops from Emden, and two more pull alongside Blücher. Just after 1am, four are sent back to take over the outer forts. Condor and two more are sent to land at Horten, the main base of the Norwegian navy. The rest of the force heads into the Narrows, Bluka leading, then Lutzal, Emden, Merve, Minesweepers R18 and R19, and Albatross is still some way back in the outer field. As pre-dawn light begins to light up the mist, Norwegian patrol boats spot the Germans passing up the sound with brief pulses of their searchlights, followed up by the sweep of a much more powerful searchlight from an outlying gun battery. At the other end of the Narrows is the Oskarborg Fortress and its supporting batteries. The position is undermanned, and they are only able to operate two of their three 11-inch guns. Six months away from retirement, Colonel Birger Eriksson stares out into the darkness, which is briefly illuminated by the flash of guns further down the Oslo field. An unknown squadron of warships is approaching. The message identifying the ships as German does not arrive in time, and he does not know for sure whether the approaching vessels are friend or foe. His orders say that he must fire warning shots first, but the old guns under his command will only get one shot due to the time their crews would need to reload. His men are a mixture of retired pensioners, new recruits, and a handful of active duty officers. Spotting an ominous dark and silent silhouette through the mist, he orders the battery to prepare to fire. Going against orders to fire warning shots first, and making the judgement that the silent and blacked out ships are not likely to be friendly, and present a clear threat to his beloved capital city of Oslo, at 4.21am on the 9th of April 1940 he makes his decision. Either I will be decorated or I will be court-martialed. Fire. Seconds later, the two 11-inch guns older than most of the men in the fortress, fire. The shells cross the 2,000 yards to the target in moments. The Battle of Drobak Sound has begun. The Oscarbald battery lands hits, deliberately aimed slightly high so as to cause serious damage but not sink the targets, giving them one last chance to turn back. The first shot smashes into the forward superstructure, knocking out the primary fire control systems and sending large fragments flying. Moments later, the second shot hits just after the funnel, knocking out one of the secondary guns, killing dozens of troops, cutting power to the main turrets, and setting fire to the aircraft hangar. The combustible materials in the hangar and the stocks of army supplies flare up, and a huge fireball rises over the ship. Some of the boiler rooms are choked with smoke as the ventilators suck the flames in from above. The mist, fires, searchlights and darkness conceal Oskarborg from Blücher, whose crew cannot see where the shots came from. 
Her secondary and AA batteries fire randomly into the Merc anyway, hoping to hit something. The Norwegian secondary batteries now open up, setting more fires and blowing more holes in Bluka's hull. The rudder is jammed to port, and only desperate emergency steering measures keep her from running aground. However, Bluka makes it through the gauntlet still afloat, leaving Lutzau at the mercy of the Norwegian guns. But now, the burning cruiser sails into the sights of the torpedo battery. Called out of retirement for the coming war, Captain Anderson readies the 50-year-old torpedoes under his command. He adjusts the settings and fires two torpedoes, keeping the third launcher in reserve just in case another ship comes past. The first torpedo hits near the forward turrets, and the small warhead does minimal damage. The second hits right in the middle of the already weakened part of the ship that's currently on fire. Bulkheads collapse, turbines seize, pumps fail, and the ship begins to heel to port and eventually comes to a stop. Meanwhile, Lutzau takes several hits, crippling the forward turret and starting fires. Seeing the torpedo impacts on Bluka and thinking there is a minefield ahead, Lutzau slows, executes a U-turn, and leads the remaining German ships back out to more open water. Having dropped anchor to avoid ripping open what's left of her hull on the rocks, Bluka founders over the next two hours as a magazine explosion in the secondary battery blows yet another hole in the side of the hull. She sinks a few hours later. Over the rest of the day, Luftwaffe bombers repeatedly attack the fortress, and airlifted troops begin an advance on Oslo. The fortress surrenders the next morning, but the delay has allowed the evacuation of the Norwegian royal family, government, and its gold reserves. They will lead the resistance to the German invasion for the next two months, before being evacuated to Britain. In the space of ten minutes of furious action, an obsolete fortress manned by raw recruits and pensioners has destroyed Germany's newest large warship, and ensured the Norwegian armed forces will be able to fight on in various forms for the rest of World War II. Colonel Ericsson and Captain Anderson will be awarded Norway's highest award for gallantry, the War Cross with Sword, after the war when the Norwegian government is restored.